Hey folks, welcome back to the Husker Big Red YouTube channel. I'm Chris Peterson and joining me as always is my co-host Danny Gillette um, here at the HuskerBigRed.com and we're here to talk some uh, Nebraska athletics here, some Nebraska football recruiting. We got a little bit of basketball news, but mostly, um, you know, more commitments from Matt Rule making more uh, news this weekend. Uh, Ja'Cory Barney, four-star wide receiver from Miami, uh, pledged on Saturday night. Uh, that was kind of a surprising decision. Apparently, Ja'Cory Barney didn't let anybody know, not, he, not either coaching staff before he made his announcement, but um, you, you could feel the, a, left, a lot of positive momentum on the Nebraska side of things. And so uh, we'll just uh, jump right into it. I guess, Danny, how are you doing on Monday morning? And uh, what do you think about Ja'Cory Barney uh, committing to Nebraska? I always love fireworks before the 4th of July, and Ja'Cory Barney was no exception. It was kind of strange just to see all the uh, – you know, 24-7 sports analyst, Christofferson, Wilt Fong, all of those analysts had him crystal balled to Miami or made predictions to Miami. And then the on three prediction machine had him to Miami, I believe, around 70%. And then it was just weird when you saw the 70%, you know, prediction. And then Nebraska with less than, I don't know, I think it was 15% at the top. I mean, I think he really did surprise everybody. Um, I love Barney. I think he's going to be another great addition. I see him more as a slot receiver. Um, I was watching some of his highlights the other day, and he performed really well on the slot. He's tremendously athletic, can high point the football really well on the catch, can make contested catches in traffic, has that speed and, you know, kind of elusiveness that the coaching staff is looking for with the teams just about everybody. So, I definitely see where he could fit in this program and, you know, just another just another good wide receiver. And anytime you can take a kid away from the Miami Hurricanes or away from the state of Florida, you know, that's always a positive, too. So credit to the coaching staff, because like many, I thought uh, Barney, given the state of our receiver room, was probably going to go to Miami. It definitely seemed that way. Miami, you know, had him for an official visit recently. Nebraska had him on June 3rd. But. Um, you know, it seemed like maybe, you know, when Ernest Campbell was kind of turning to Nebraska, you know, that, uh, you know, maybe there wasn't going to be a spot for Ja'Cory Barney. Um, but, uh, you know, Ernest Campbell, obviously, after that visit, you know, Texas A&M was able to regain the momentum of that recruitment. So, um, you know, they they kind of flipped back to Ja'Cory Barney and they were able to, you know, went out over a pretty, you know, Miami's a, a pretty solid recruiting staff right now, especially yeah. they have a lot of, uh, you know, NIL to throw around probably as much as anybody and so, I mean, we can see, you know, still that, you know, NIL does matter. It's not everything. And, and Nebraska definitely pulled out a good win here. You have to give Garrett McGuire a lot of credit, Matt Rule a lot of credit. And yeah, it's, it's really um, insane how they just totally revamped, you know, this wide receiver room over the last, you know, two years, basically taking like double digit guys at the wide receiver position. And so, I mean, yeah, it's just been a total, a total revamp. And, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, with Amari Sanders, I know people are, you know, wondering probably, why is Nebraska taking so many, you know, receivers and cornerbacks? And it's like, well, I mean, on the defensive side of the ball, especially with cornerback, I mean, Nebraska under Scott Frost, you know, they always had that nickel, you know, that nickel position or whatever, that linebacker position that they always kind of, kind of make it a linebacker. They didn't recruit enough cornerbacks. I said that I said that last year, you know, they didn't have enough corners on this roster. So I, I really, it doesn't surprise me that they're going hard at corner and um, the same with wide receiver too. I mean, it's, you need to have these dynamic guys, some we've talked about, you know, Quinn Clark potentially could play somewhere else. I mean, Ja'Cory Barney could too, I suppose, but I definitely see him as a slot like you. He's six foot, 160. I don't know what he runs in the 100. I mean, he doesn't have anything on his profile. He's not a track guy, um, but he definitely is fast. I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. I know he, I guarantee if you put him on a track, he'd run it probably in, you know, sub 11 seconds. So um, I'm not worried about that at all. And like you said, he's got great hands. Um, he makes a lot of really good, uh, contested catches for being a shorter guy. So yeah. he's got good ball skills. Um, yeah, it's it's really, you know, you look at this receiver group all, you know, as a whole from this class, just, you know, Davon Hall and McMorris, I think, are, you know, McMorris is a guy that can play all around. He's not just mm. a slot guy. Um, Hall's, you know, is a big guy on the outside, Quinn Clark. And then you get, um, you know, Barney, who I, I think can move around, probably will be a, focused a lot, you know, in the slot, like you said, but yeah. Just another really dynamic player, a guy who's probably going to take some jet screens. You know, he played quarterback and running back as well as wide receiver. So another really good get, and it's exciting to see that uh, pipeline. You know, you we were, were talking about it off air, Nebraska trying to establish this Florida pipeline, 
you know, with Matt Rule as opposed to Scott Frost. So hopefully they can, you know, have some more success than they did under the Frost uh, regime in the state of Florida. Well, I think there's a plan in place. I mean, the hiring of Philip Simpson, who was a former Florida high school football coach. I mean, at least there's somebody for the kids to kind of rely on there. You know, they're not on an island. And I understand Scott Frost used to coach at UCF, but it always helps to have, you know, somebody else, you know, from the state of, you know, Florida, somebody who knows the state well to kind of be there when you're in the Midwest like this. I mean, look at the Texas kids. Matt Rule was able to bring in Dr. Susan Elsa into the program to kind of help facilitate things a little bit. So, you know, from a personnel standpoint, Nebraska's done a good job of trying to surround these out-of-state kids with, you know, people that they know. And so I think that's really important, too. And I don't think that was there when Frost was um, uh, the head coach the last time they tried this big Florida, you know, kind of move in terms of in terms of recruiting. Um, You know, but just looking again, I got to give credit to Garrett McGuire. He's had quite the last month or so. He's been involved in the recruitments of David Hall, Barney, McMorris, Lacey and Quinn Clark. And so, you know, he's been really busy trying to get. this wide receiver room back to, you know, where it needs to be. And I don't think, like we said before, that depth is going to be much of an issue. And this is um, also another, you kind of alluded to it, but another win in a contested, you know, recruitment. I mean, there was Carter Nelson with Georgia, Notre Dame and Penn State, uh, Kiwan Lacey, um, Old Miss was there along with some other schools, you know, like Baylor was in the mix. Um, you know, Ja'Cory Barney, the top three was Miami and Texas A&M. So it's, you know, Dave Hall had an offer from Tennessee. I know it was late, but they still offered. So there's a lot of Nebraska's winning, you know, some some contested battles here. It's not I know that they've taken some guys that, you know, are their camp evaluation offers where, you know, the offer sheet maybe wasn't as impressive. But a lot of those guys, they would have earned more offers in the fall. And I bet some still will get you know, off like Braylon Prude, I bet you is some team from Texas is going to like yeah. offer that kid trying to flip him. I guarantee it. Um, so I, I do think that that's part of it. But so it's not like I, I think Nebraska is hitting both ends of it. Right. Like they're they're doing their camp evaluations and finding the diamonds in the rough type. But they're also winning some pretty big time, you know, recruiting battles. And it looks like, you know, another could be coming with uh, Amari Sanders, um, you know, is Another guy that, you know, visited on June 3rd um, hasn't he hasn't taken any official visits anywhere else yet. He's visited a few places unofficially Louisville, Michigan in Florida. Florida offered him in May. Virginia offered him this month as well. But, you know, Matt Rule throughout the 305 last night, there was the picture on Twitter. And to me, that that has to be about Amari Sanders, because I mean, he already he tweeted about Ja'Cory Barney on Saturday, the day that he so to me, it's like I don't think it would be. I, I just don't – the 305 to me means more is coming. You know, whether that's Amari Sanders or somebody else, I don't know. But that's what, you know, to me, that trying to interpret Matt Rule's tweets, that's what I felt it was, you know, a sign that yeah. maybe they got another commitment from Amari Sanders. Well, they got a crystal ball for Sanders um, on Sunday, right? Like a like a medium confidence crystal ball? Yeah, from Wilt so, Fong, Steve Wilt Fong, I'm so. guessing that's what it is. And, you know, any time – and look. I don't care if the Miami Hurricanes struggled last year. They're still a nationally known brand. Florida Gators the same way. You know, Florida State is on the rise. So at this point, I'm looking at any recruit that we can get out of Florida as a win. You know, and I think it's really, really kind of fascinating that, you know, there's a lot of kids um, coming from Florida. I believe, let's see, Corey Collier, Will Spaghetti, um, uh, what's the why? Uh, Barney, and then one more. They're all from Miami Palmetto. I can't think of the fourth one, but they're starting to build, you know, some connections in Miami Palmetto. And, you know, um, Sanders is from Gulliver Prep, a very fast corner. Um, And, you know, it just goes to show that this coaching staff is, again, hitting in all areas of the country. Or if they're not going to win a recruiting battle, they're going to try like hell and i think that's really important and you know you look at these areas that they're recruiting a lot in florida texas the state of nebraska maybe a little bit out in california but florida texas nebraska those seem to be the main areas for the program right now and that's a trio of states that i'm very comfortable with yeah matt rules done a nice job i mean there's you can definitely nebraska and texas are you know the two Big ones. I mean, Matt Rule has got, you know, 50, 50 commitments right now with 
with the past two classes, essentially. And over half of those have come from Nebraska and Texas. Um, so that kind of tells you where the, but yeah, then Florida, I think Pennsylvania, they've started to do some work in Colorado. Yeah. You know, I, so it's, I mean, they're really doing a nice job within kind of that 500 mile radius. And then with Florida too, but that goes back to the hire of, you know, Philip Simpson. I mean, this was a plan to, you know, get those high school ties there and, and that's paid dividends just like, hiring Bob Wager and the, yep. um, Garrett McGuire's paid dividends in Texas. So, I mean, Matt Rule just knows what he's doing. He, you know, he, when he put this staff together, you know, he put it together, you know, with recruiting in mind, I think partially, and, and that has really paid off. And the thing that's interesting to me about Amari Sanders is like the first thing I, I thought, um, I'll tell you when I saw the crystal ball pop in there, I'm like, well, what does this mean for Caleb Benning? What, what is going on with him? Because that that is one recruitment that I just don't I have no grasp on. It's really weird. You know, he um, I feel like Benning's done. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I, I felt like after Donovan Jones committed that Benning was done. I mean, I kind of thought that too, but you know, it's it's just I yeah, it's really weird because you know, I mean obviously his dad is such a you know, um a, not a force, but I mean he's obviously a local media person and well, he was a great player, yeah. you know, he was a really great player. And I think I think that Caleb Benning is a pretty good player, too. I just am not sure. I mean, I got a lot of flack. I remember, um, you know, I noticed on the head of the, the June 23rd weekend, he wasn't there visiting. He, you know, on three, just kind of took him off the visit yep. list, you know, all of a sudden. And so I reported that and a lot of people gave me a bunch of flack for it. I even was even getting ripped in one of the forums and some people stood up for me, though. But but they were like, oh, he's going to he's going to come taking a, a visit on Monday. And it was like, well, the Monday was the dead period. So it was like that, obviously. They're like, oh, well, Damon Benning said this on the radio. And it's like, no, he didn't because they can't take a visit on a dead period. You know, so it's like, I don't know if he I, I'm looking at the end of this month because I don't know. There's been talk of, um, you know, him taking another visit. I know he's been talking about deciding in December. Um, so, you know, but for a lower ranked player, that seems somewhat risky because I know there's yeah. not going to be a lot of spots. Um, so I don't know. It just. I feel like he's a good player. I just I worry that if Nebraska doesn't take him, he's going to go somewhere else and play well, and they're going to regret it. So I I know that the numbers are stacking up at cornerback and and wide receiver, but I don't know. I just I still it's it's just still interesting to me. I still would think about trying to get him in the class, but you know, obviously there's something going on there because why why didn't he take why isn't he why didn't he visit anywhere in June? I mean, it's just a, it's just a weird. I mean, he's the number six player in the state, um, so he's got some legit offers, but his recruitment's kind of going down a slow uh, path right now. Especially if he's told the Nebraska football coaching staff that he's deciding in December, then I'm not sure I want to wait necessarily for him to make a decision either. I mean, yeah. you know, that's his choice. I mean, and you got to respect his choice, but it could be something as simple as he just wants to go somewhere else out of state. But, you know, it is kind of a weird recruitment because we haven't really heard a lot about it, and I thought it was kind of interesting that he – canceled his visit and um you know although i believe he canceled his visit right after jones committed so i'm wondering if there if there's a correlation there but um you know i just think to me i don't think betting is going to be a part of this class things can change in recruiting and i'll be happy to be wrong but between donovan jones and then you have a guy like sanders that can play multiple positions and you have rex guthrie like you know things are starting to fill up in, in the backfield and you know, I'm starting to think that maybe Caleb Benning isn't part of the plan at uh, corner or even safety for that matter. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we'll. I think we'll definitely know if uh, you know if they take Amari Sanders. That will be, I think, somewhat telling. I don't. It doesn't surprise me that w they would take one more defensive back. Like I said, this this program did not recruit enough defensive backs under no. Scott. For, I don't know why that they. We're like determined to be like we're only going to play four dbs and our fifth player will be aligned like it was just beyond i just don't understand it still to this day when every team in college football is running spread offenses and it's like yeah it worked when you had jojo demon but that's not that's not an everyday type of player you know he was a unique player and so i just felt like trying to you know put players from a square peg into a round hole like your nickelback should be a cornerback like that's just you know or at least a safety I mean, I can get playing a, a safety, but you need five actual defensive backs. So I think it's smart for this program to actually, you know, recruit. And you're running a three-three-five defense. So I mean, right there, forty-five percent of your defense is going to be defensive backs, right? I mean, that's like your base alignment. So your recruiting class probably should reflect that. And I think also based on just the, 
you know, the poor depth kind of at the position, you know, and, and the way Nebraska recruited it before, I, I think it just, it makes sense to me to add a bunch of versatile athletes in the secondary. So that's why I would like also Amari Sanders six. I mean, he's six, one, almost six, two, you know, he's a three, he's ranked kind of in the similar reign as, as a Carl on Jones. I think he's in the top 700. So, I mean, he's a, he's a legit kid and Florida's Florida offered. So, um, yeah, Nebraska, it would be smart to push and, and close it out if that's like, you know, because all these other schools are probably like if he doesn't commit in the summer, I'm sure Florida will be like getting him for an official visit. Michigan, I know for a fact, um, you know, their cornerback board is really dried up. So it would not surprise me at all if they shifted to Amari Sanders. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where this recruitment goes in the next few weeks. And I think I'm also with the crystal ball. I'm also wondering, you know, it's like none have followed. No, no local I mean, not local, but none of the Nebraska guys have like followed with a projection or a crystal ball. So that kind of has my interest peaked a little bit. Like, why is that? Yeah. And it's interesting to note about Sanders, too, is that he's a two sport athlete. He played basketball. His brother actually plays basketball for Notre Dame. And so, you know how we love the two sport athletes and, you know, just his leaping ability. And, you know, I think two multiple sport athletes, you know, tend to have an easier time in terms of conditioning. I, I remember a lot of kids at my high school always used to play basketball if they were playing football in the fall. They would play basketball in the winter, and then that would help them get ready for the following season of football. So the fact that Sanders is also um, playing basketball, I think he averaged actually 11 points per game last season uh, for Gulliver Prep. You know, I think that's really important, too, just for conditioning purposes. Yeah, and it's always good. I think it's always good to have a guy that plays, you know, multiple sports. I definitely, you know, I like basketball players. It's just there's a lot it's depending on the positions, too. But there's a there could be a, you can see a lot of translatable skills, you know, like a tight end playing power forward, you know, like a guy goes up and gets rebounds, catches the ball a lot in the post. You know, what I mean, like you can see the natural hands. So there are a lot of translatable skills. Um, but yeah, Amari Sanders is a big, long athlete, and it would be nice to add another one of those guys to the secondary. And um, I guess when we're another question we were kind of talking about is, you know, with this class uh, as a whole, I mean, Nebraska right now is at 23 commitments. I think they're tied for third right now. And all of the I think only Stanford and Michigan have more uh, commitments than Nebraska right now. So how big is this class going to get? I mean, I wrote um, over the week, I don't see it getting to 30. Um, I really, maybe it is, maybe, maybe they could add seven more guys. I, I wouldn't shock me if it was like somewhere between like 26 and 28. Yeah. I definitely think there's some more 30 would, would surprise me a little bit, but what, what do you think at, at this point right now, knowing what's, what's left on the board, but knowing we also still have a lot of time before signing day and some new targets probably will emerge. What do you think that final number is going to look like? I would say probably around 28, at which point I think you're all, you're all set as far as the. 2024 class goes obviously I mean 28 given you know and I and and I was saying about know, this the other day um Nebraska last year coming off a three and eight season I get a new coaching staff but you're talking about a program that hasn't had success in quite a while combined with the new coaching staff who have said and done all the right things but nobody knows what it's going to be like yet nobody knows you know what the schemes are or as a recruit, you don't know, you know, where they're going to put you on the field necessarily. For example, if you're a wide receiver and when there's a lot of bodies there to get potentially 28 commits is outstanding. It's absolutely outstanding because it shows that the coaching staff has recruited really hard and there's a lot of kids buying in and they want to turn this thing around. And if you had told me a year ago that <laughs> Matt Rule would be the head coach, we'd get 20, 23 commitments so far, maybe 28 um, when all is said and done. and we would have, you know, a top 20 class right now. I mean, I'd be extremely impressed. And it just goes to show that a lot of kids want to buy in and they see what this coaching staff is doing. Yeah, Matt Rule's done a great job so far. Um, and I think he, he's going to do a great job. You know, we're 60 days away from uh, the regular season opener, I guess, at this point, or less than 60 days. Um, so it's going to be, it's closing in soon, but I agree with the, yeah, about 28. I mean, you look, Grant Bricks is out there. Obviously we don't know when he's going to decide, but that's obviously a name of Mari Sanders. Um, you know, there's a couple of edge guys that have kind of come up on the board. Um, you know, Caleb Benning is still out there. So there, there's still a few targets out there. I mean, you look at positional need in terms of this class. Um, 
I don't think that they, you know, I think they're pretty set now at wide receiver. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, not that they wouldn't take, you know, like if Ryan Wingo or somebody, it was like, I, I just think that they really believe in getting talented players. So I, I don't think that they're that worried about the number. I mean, I think obviously they're worried about the scholarship numbers a little bit, but for the most part in this era, I just think that they know there's going to be, you know, guys that leave. So I just don't think they're that worried about like how many corners they have. And they're just trying to add as many good football players as they can. Um, but, you know, offensive tackle, I think, is the spot that they need. Obviously, with Grant Bricks, he could, you know, shore up that need. I don't – I mean, it does worry me a little bit to only take one running back two years in a row. Um, I just think, you know, it seems like you should be taking two. So, I wouldn't surprise me if they got involved with another running back at some point. Um, it just – you know, that – just two running backs in two years just does not seem like enough. I don't care how many guys are in the room right now. I just think, you know, I think you should be trying to add two running backs a year just based on that position. Quarterback, obviously, they're good. Um, I think they're pretty pretty set at linebacker, you know, in this class. Um, I think that they could use some defensive linemen. They definitely could use an edge, and uh, that's that's really about it. So, I mean, the I guess the two biggest needs that I see right now are edge and offensive tackle. Um, obviously, I would love to get a nose tackle, but those aren't those guys don't necessarily grow on trees in the in the three star ranking range. So, and there's not really any viable targets i can think of for nebraska right now i'm sure they'll develop some though i would love grant bricks i mean he is he is built for big 10 play he's so physical he extends his hands immediately knocks his guy back i could see him doing really well in the red zone on running plays just you know bowling people over so i would love bricks and you know i think in terms of the edge rusher they 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 already have guys like kai wallen and things like that so i think they can buy themselves a little time just allowing these, you know, pieces to develop. And, you know, for example, if Ryan Wingo uh, wanted to come to Nebraska, I wouldn't say no. I mean, I loved Ryan Wingo uh, when he was coming to visit in March. I've I've always loved Wingo. He's fast. I know the coaching staff visited him. I think it was in January. So if Ryan Wingo wanted to come to Nebraska, I'd, I'd be all for it, for example. But we'll see how things play out. I mean, imagine if we start winning. Imagine if we start winning, like what other dominoes could fall. And I've said this before, in comparison to what we're going to have in 24 and 2025, this year is a pretty favorable schedule, all things considered. Yeah, it is pretty favorable. And I do think that this team has a chance to make some noise in the Big Ten West. I know that, you know, you can call me a Kool-Aid drinker or whatever, but I mean, I think that Jeff Sims is a really good quarterback. Um and I just I, I buy I buy a lot of what Matt Rule you know is doing with this team. I mean, you look at the off, I think the offensive line is just going to be a lot better. I really do. Yeah. Um, you know, because the I mean, for one factor is you know Turner Corcoran's not probably going to be playing left tackle, and if he's playing left guard or whatever, I mean, you know, he can be fine there. And and it you know so then then really to me it's like you know can you get Bryce Benhart going? And if that happens, then I think you're pretty set across the offensive line as long as um, you know Teddy stays healthy on the left side that's a big x factor but you know you're basically getting three new starters and then you're moving uh you know and then you get three well i shouldn't say new but three got three basically starters from before that are proven players right and then you know ben hart and corcoran are both four star guys that just haven't played that well so i mean really talent wise like nebraska's offensive line should be fine and i think with some decent coaching this year they they will be fine um and the running games there i mean thomas fedoni i think is a guy that um, like I totally believe what he said. Like I think he's going to be a first or second round pick when he's as long as he stays healthy this year and next year. I mean, this might be his only year. This might be his only year on the field. He might go out and have like 50, 60 catches for eight hundred yards and go be a top sixty pick next year. I mean, he's that good. He literally is that good. So I mean, he he. I I just don't think that people are really. I mean, I know they're excited about. Fedoni, but if he if Thomas Fedoni is really 100 percent healthy and can stay that way the whole season, I don't think people realize how much of an impact he's going to have on this offense. People thought about you know the impact he was going to have um, in 2020 when he first signed with Nebraska, and you know then he kind of then between all the injuries and stuff, people kind of didn't buy his stock as much. But he really is you know uh, an aggressive almost like a wide receiver at the tight end position. And, you know, Nebraska's gotten some good production out of the tight end room over the last couple seasons, and I'd love to see that continue with with Fedoni. I mean, 
you know, Gilbert too, assuming his waiver and stuff clears, which I haven't heard anything about that. But, um, you know, that's a very formidable tight end room. And then you have guys coming coming down the uh, bend here and Carter Nelson and then, uh, and then Ian Flint and Keelan Smith, who could potentially also go out to wide receiver. I mean, there are options in the room. And I trust Bob Wager with this room and, you know, his evaluations as well. I, I, I think he is honestly going to be a very underrated hire and a big asset to this program. Yep, I agree. Yeah, I definitely agree um, with that. Bob, um, you know, Bob Wager just, you know, he's a guy that's that's been a head coach. So I think he's going to help this team um, immensely, not just not just on the recruiting trail, but, you know, in the coaching staff and just game management and um, just, you know, you look at all the close games Nebraska's lost. I mean, they've played in more more close games than basically any other program. And they've had a, a horrible, horrible record in close. I mean, really, you should be about. I mean, most teams, I would say, are probably about average and, you know, like just normally you should win about as many close games as you lose. That's kind of the bell curve, right? And the better teams win more, you know. So Nebraska was like as as bad as you could possibly get. If they could just get somewhat close to – like if Nebraska's 500 and, you know, close games under Scott Frost, even if they won 40% of their close games under Scott Frost, he'd still be here. So, like, it's not that this program – it's not like Colorado. I mean, they were literally like getting embarrassed almost every single week. Um, just, you know, I'll just to use them as an example. I'm not saying Nebraska didn't have, yeah, like Michigan blew them out and Oklahoma blew them out, like, you know, whatever. But it's most most weeks they had a shot and they just they screwed up. They screwed it up because the Illinois. coaching staff. Yeah, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, they could have won all three of those games. They could have easily won all three of those games last year. They should have beat they should have beat Illinois the last two years. But Brett Bielema was just way better of a coach than, and you saw i i knew that that one game when uh brett bielma's debut game as head coach and they whipped nebraska's ass i mean nebraska only lost by eight points but it was clear that scott frost did not have his team ready to play like he had, he never did it was a joke he was a, he was an absolute joke but the fact that brett bielma in his first game just came in there and coached circles around scott frost like that told you i was like man if we had brett bielma we would have won that game and so yeah. i just so i really feel like I said this so many times, but if you just have somebody with like half a brain who's competent, this this team can win because it's not like they were that far off. It was a few no, I agree. small things. And and Matt Rule's not he's not an idiot like Scott Frost was. So I really do think that this team I'll be shocked. I'll be stunned. You know, people can like make fun of me or whatever, but I'll be stunned if this team is not in a bowl game next year. I would agree. I mean, I would agree. I I would Agree, and I feel like the level of preparation that this coaching staff, you know, is going to bring to the table is going to be leaps and bounds ahead of what previous coaching staffs have been able to do. I mean, you, you know, they're they're already pretty much done with the 2024 class, and that'll let them get a head start on you know 2025. When's the last time you know a class was done this early from a Nebraska coaching staff? Not 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 recently, and not to the point where. You know, we wouldn't have to scramble for guys at the last minute. So, I mean, just the amount of, you know, readiness and preparation. And, you know, I I think scheme is going to, you know, favor Nebraska as well. I love what Tony White is trying to implement in the 335. And, you know, I'm curious to see what Marcus Satterfeld, how he leaves his stamp on the offense. But I trust him. And I know he got some flack at South Carolina. But, you know, I think – you know, South Carolina was still able to, you know, make things happen and put up points. So in the SEC, that's always, you know, a good thing to see, given how tough, you know, those teams are. Yeah, and it's always easy to blame the the blame the play caller. I mean, that's just that's a really yeah. easy yeah. thing to do. So, um, you know, I'm not worried about that. And I, I think, man, just the way they've rebuilt this offense, there, there's going to be speed on this Nebraska offense like there's never been before. I mean, and and the depth that wide receiver, not, not that Nebraska hasn't had good wide receivers, but I don't know that they've ever recruited a hall of receivers, you know, like this in back-to-back -back years with Nelson and Malachi Coleman and just all the depth. And it, it's really exciting, and I can't wait to see all these guys on the field at the same time. They have, they've, they've had good wide receivers. They haven't had depth like this, and I think that's going to be huge. We're not going to be relying on one kid to, you know, lead our entire offense at receiver, and then when he gets hurt, we're going to panic. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to do that anymore, and, you know, we don't have to worry about, 
you know, this one player needs to develop right now or else we're screwed. We don't have to worry about that either. I mean, that's the beauty of having depth, and I'm excited to see, you know, this coaching staff really take over. I can't wait to see Nelson. I can't wait to see McMorris and Hall. And, you know, there's just a lot to be excited about. Danny Kalen, I mean, this 2024 class could change the trajectory of the program in a big way. And I can't wait to see it all kind of unfold and not to get too ahead of ourselves but you know I think that this 2024 class has the potential to kind of really put Nebraska back where it needs to be I definitely agree we'll see where you know the ranking ends up um I know on three is redoing their rankings right now so I'm hoping that Daniel uh Keeling will get his boost up to being a four star in the composite, you know, on three needs to bump up his ranking. So we'll see where that goes and, and Carter Nelson and everybody else, but that'll be pretty exciting. Um, so to make sure you guys uh, don't miss out on any recruiting stuff, you know, make sure you guys subscribe to, uh, you know, our YouTube channel here, hit the subscribe button and make sure that you guys check out uh, huskerbigred.com. We, uh, I know we do these podcasts here a couple days a week, but um, you know, we definitely have a lot of content, um, you know, throughout at, at our website. So make sure you're checking that out. Um, I do want to say before we go, um, we should mention Sam Greasel, uh, you know, the former Nebraska point guard is going to be playing in the summer league with the Boston Celtics. So that's going to give him an opportunity to, you know, potentially make the NBA probably more likely as a chance to make the G league. And, and that's a, a true path to, you know, professional basketball. Yeah. So um, that'll be something to watch. I know Danny is a Massachusetts guy that'll, you'll have uh, yeah. some root, some, um, you know, connections there. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun to see him in the Summer League, even if it's only the Summer League for a little bit, and uh, good for him. He's a guy that really worked his butt off for the Nebraska program, even in the year he was here. You can tell he really loved being in Lincoln, so I'm excited to see how and if this translates to the NBA, and I'll certainly be watching for him. Uh, I I think the Summer League starts tonight, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see how things go for him. I certainly hope he does well. Yeah, I was keeping – I'm not sure um, if Derek Walker is playing in the summer league, but I know he worked out with some different teams. So it could be something to watch. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of different summer leagues, so he'll probably pop up there and then, uh, yeah, but it's going to be, I know the Nebraska basketball team is making their trip to Spain pretty soon. Uh, KSA is going to be playing in i uh, I can't remember what tournament it is. Maybe it's the world championships or something, but uh, he's going to be playing for Japan this summer. So that, that'll be fun to watch to kind of see, you know, where his game is developed at this point. Um, but yeah, make sure uh, we'll have updates on all of it at huskerbigred.com. Um, thanks for everybody who's subscribed recently. Um, we appreciate it. Make sure you hit that yeah. subscribe button. Uh, so you don't miss any of our content, you know, make sure you share, comment, like, um, and uh, hit that notification button too. So it'll, uh, alert you when we uh, put up a new video or podcast and uh, beyond that um, have a great week everybody and uh, go big red go big red